the uh, great pleasure to welcome back Dr. Emma Tetlow. Emma spoke to us last in November 2020 about the fines generally on the, in the Colne Valley as a result of the HS2 works uh, for whom she um, is a STEM ambassador, um, an archaeological consultant and um, historic right. environment lead for the sections of the HS2 in the uh, Colne Valley and the North Holt and Old Oak Common areas. Uh, and interestingly, she told us last time about her work with Birmingham University in the past that took her to a dig in the back garden of Buckingham Palace. So she's got, <laughs> she's got an immense amount of experience in uh, 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 and publications to her credit in, in a whole variety of different archaeological environments and uh, including rail, wind farms, cable routes and uh, doubtless many others as well. So we're delighted to have you back. Emma, thank you for offering a further meeting because last time you weren't able to tell us about the Hillingdon Horde, no. which this time you are. So I'm going to um, hand over to you and to please tell us about the, the Hillingdon Horde and the Iron Age uh, coins that uh, were, were found. We're excited to hear about it. I'm going to tell you about a lot more as well, actually. Um, it's been quite, it was quite, it was quite frustrating at that point because we hadn't long found the Horde when, um, I'm just going to try and move that seat quite, yeah. Um, we hadn't long found the hoard. When I spoke to you last, it was sort of three months, and I really obviously couldn't talk to you about it um, because it was embargoed. Um, so it's great to be able to come back. But I'm gonna, going to also tell you about a lot of the finds that we were also sort of working on when I was talking to you um, previously um, in the Hillingdon area. So this is quite exciting to come back, and thank you for allowing me to talk again. I'm going to recap on some of the bits and pieces we spoke to last time. I'm also talking to you in a slightly different capacity. I believe last time it was a Costa and Skanska joint venture, and now I'm a Skanska Costa and Strabag joint venture. So a part of main work. So let's let's head into this. So just to give you an idea, STS is split up slightly different to CSJV. Um, I'm actually responsible theoretically. I'm responsible for the whole of this area from um, used to approaches all the way through to Harville Road but because my role is quite demanding in Area West because we have a lot of forthcoming archaeological excavations in the area some of which I'm hoping you're going to be able to come and see which I've been talking to Jane about um, it's I'm very very much engaged in Area West and I have somebody in Area East which is between um, literally Euston Station and the Parkway Tunnel I have somebody else that looks after the built heritage in that area because it's predominantly built heritage um, we have found some archaeology there, and actually, I haven't incorporated in this um, presentation actually, which you might have, found, which would have been interesting actually. So that's that's remiss. I maybe I'll have to come back again. Um, and then area central, we have Kensal Green Cemetery. We did have Westgate Ben Shaft, but we've had that removed from scope, and that's an interesting story in itself because we were hoping to find Paleolithic material, but interrogation of the geo the the um, GI data for the ground investigation, the head construction of the vent shaft proved to us that there was going to be none of the type of material there that we were looking for and throughout sort of the course of that being constructed I've had input into the area and viewed it and we were quite correct but anyway let's head to area west and um, Hillingdon, Uxbridge and Ryslip. So I think I explained to you last time that um, the legislation of the man for the management of cultural heritage within HS2 is actually quite rigorous. We are mandated by the environmental minimum requirements the heritage memorandum and the instrument that sort of guides all our works which is the generic written scheme of investigation historic environment research delivery strategy that we all call herds um, and that lets us sort of look critically at the archaeology of each specific area so this is not just Hillingdon this is not just area south this is all up towards route and let's face it to be honest Harvard the land west of Harville Road around Juice Farm and West Hyde Again, that's as much of an interest to you people as it is. Uh, so, you know, we don't just stop there. This is all managed all the way to Birmingham in a similar manner. Um, and we look at sort of things critically. What, how can we best apply um, the techniques we have to us? Um, you know, how can we innovate? How can we look at sort of strategies to improve our, no improve our knowledge and be efficient, you know, look for efficiencies and be commercially sensible? So it also provides, again, Let's forget about sort of the commercial side and that kind of thing. We'll look at the, the sort of practical matters of actually managing the, the historic environment. So it provides guidance and structure and it provides us with a methodology for liaising with HS2. And in my case, Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service, who's my main stakeholder, um, who also is part of Historic England. 
I also we also have a separate sort of curator within Historic England as well, who sort of manages the more technical side of it. Um, so anything such as environmental archaeology that we're going to talk about later, so that's things like looking at pollen and beetles, which are very close to my heart, and waterlogged plant remains, and anything technical like pres preserving sort of features and um, structures in situ. So again, as I've suggested previously, this gives us continuity and consistency of process and the methods and the methods of investigation applied across route are similar. So they can all be sort of transferred back to each other. We can look at them collaboratively. We can compare and we can we can trust and we can learn. Um, our decision making process is, is driven by something called knowledge creation objectives, KCs as we call them. Now, these were determined by myself in my role with CSJV. Um, and these are continued now through to SCS railways. So these look, the, from, we take guidance from the regional and the national research um, strategies for sort of different time periods and different areas. So we look at the sort of the Iron Age, the Iron Age research strategy, the research strategy for this part of the UK. Um, where applicable, we can apply sort of, you know, if we, if we sort of, as we are here, close to Buckinghamshire and sort of the children, we look at their, you know, their research strategy as well and how, how we can really sort of feed and inform the archaeological record area by area. And again, Emma, being Emma, can, Emma can I interrupt you there? Are we supposed to yeah. be seeing your slides at this point? Yeah. Can you oh, no, them? no, we're not seeing your slides. Oh, no, that's terrible. <laughs> to be honest, that was that, that there's, there's been no pictures. You haven't missed anything. No, I didn't think sharing. we'd miss much. No, because uh, no. what you were talking about sound perfectly explanatory in itself without pictures. Would be nice to see some people. Would be nice to see something though, wouldn't it? Hang on a minute, let's sort. So if you do share on. screen again, there we go. Where are we share screen? Screen share. So we want that one. Let me know when you can see them properly. Thank you for telling me as well. Not at all. It's just started now. How about that? And we're seeing the whole of PowerPoint at the moment. Ah, there we go. How's about that one then? Does that work? Uh, uh, yes, it's that's fine. We're seeing just Excellent. an individual slide now. That's great. Fantastic. So we've just got to the bottom of that side. So um, again, this allows us to determine a strategic approach, so we can look at the whole route in sort of collaboration. So we're looking at the um, we look we're not looking we're looking at things objectively, and we're looking at the whole landscape based process. Um, and again, it's about comparing and contrasting results and making sure that we understand what each other's, which, which each other's areas are doing. And we had um, quite a big um, meeting in Birmingham actually just last week where we sort of discussed our results and how we'd applied different techniques, which is actually really productive and really quite interesting and providing much thought for going forward. We're in a very different position in Hillingdon now. Um, we were, in terms of the sort of the works I came to talk to you about, which was the enabling works um, for CSJV, we were actually quite behind everyone else because I was the last package to be let. So we were quite sort of working from a back foot in terms of the archaeology. But now we've actually overtaken everybody else. And we're now in main works where those, some of those are still in the night, it's still in the, the early work stage. Now, one of the things that's interesting about West Rysett Golf Course, because everything is undertaken, everything else is undertaken under the Hybrid Act. So we are mandated by HS2. The bulk of West Rysett Golf Course, so anything beyond the line that you can see at the moment in the golf course where we've got the CLD fencing, which is the green sort of mesh fencing. Anything north of that is actually under a town and country planning application. So we're working on this very differently which is making the actual process quite interesting in how it works and actually being normal planning legislation, which is completely different to the hybrid bill. So I'm going to bypass that because this sort of covers what are the driving factors where we retain an element of the normal planning legislation. Unfortunately, it doesn't talk about the Town and Country Planning Act, which is sort of, as you can imagine, is quite sort of involved. Um, these are sort of what uh, the Schedule 20, which is the sort of burials act, which deals with any sort of burial grounds or any unexpected um, finds of human remains. Schedule 19, which is ancient monuments. We have no ancient monuments in our area and the route has actually been plotted to avoid ancient monuments. Schedule 18, which is listed buildings. We do have a couple of listed buildings in this area, but we'll not be impacting them where we would need one of these documents. And then we have the undertaking assurances within the individual members of the public. So we also have the High Speed Rail Act, which also covers the whole of the works that we undertake. 
So what did we apply to rice it when I was first sort of determining what works I thought we were going to require in this area? What was going to drive the works that we were going to undertake and how we we're going to make sure that we looked after the archaeology properly? So quite a few of them, because personal interest and also our proximity to the Thames, involved the actual sort of Paleolithic of the Thames and looking at the river valleys and trying to... And, as it says here, the first olive creation objective was to look at what is beyond the river valley. The Paleolithic within river valleys themselves is actually quite well understood. But what was happening outside these valleys is not well understood at all. And here we had an opportunity to look, particularly as we've had a quite undulate landscape with some really nice sort of high, higher areas of ground, which would have been quite pleasant to, to inhabit. So again, here we suggest in the second one, look at the location of Paleolithic deposits. That goes back to Westgate Bench after it was unsuccessful, which is in the River Brent. Um, develop models associated with the Bytham and the Proto Thames and other Anglian rivers. I think actually one of the things that's coming through from West Ryswick Golf Course that actually doesn't come through particularly well in this presentation is that I think we have a very interesting alluvially driven landscape in that area that we're going to look at far more with SCS railways than we do with CSJV. Um, look at the high descent density of prehistoric settlements and the evidence of the Colm Valley. Does this reflect a true sort of, um, you know, true sort of prehistoric occupation or we're looking at a bias? Actually, evidence at the moment is suggesting that this is true, that we had a lot of occupation in this area during the um, sort of from, very, from the early prehistoric period right the way through to the Iron Age, as we'll come to shortly. Again, identify sequences of environmental change. So we'll come to that again. Um, not so much for the, 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 the upper Paleolithic, early Paleolithic, but we've got some nice medieval results. Romano British occupation has sadly been lacking still. And then the medieval landscape. The medieval landscape in this area is rich, varied, and an incredible um, archaeological resource that we've been uncovering during the works for CSJV. And also will continue to do so with SES Railways. So what was our scope? So this is my area. I was sort of ta tasked with looking at everything from West Ryswick Portal, which is the little um, British rail sign down, well, the rail sign down there, all the way to Harville Road. And I also did a bit of West Harville Road when I first started on the job. Now, CSJV mobilised 10 times, and this is sort of what we looked at. So I think I, I presented this slide before. So we had West Ryswick Golf Course, which is originally 33 trenches. We also have the Thames, so it's two sites, which didn't yield much archaeology. The Thames sewer diversion yielded incredible levels of archaeology that we didn't expect. Northern sustainable placement, um, again, not much archaeology. We've just been back there to do some further work as part of SCS. Trenches at New Year's Green, we had that was the best archaeology I've seen across our area. So I'm going to present some of the, the results from there. Coptal North, again, not particularly, um, not, did not yield particularly high levels. And then the Southern Sustainable Placement, relatively sort of sparse levels of dispersed archaeology, but still, nonetheless, of still interest. But it did very much come over the New Year's Green and the later term sewer diversion were real hotspots. And I think this is related to geology, which I'll come to later. So ah, that's in the wrong place. I'm going to skip that. So this is the chronology that we've sort of yielded so far. So this is CSJV work and current SES investigations. We think we've pushed the occupation in this area back to the Paleolithic 45,000 years ago. We possibly have an item of Mousterian date. We're not sure about this yet. It's not confirmed. We think we have. We're pretty convinced, but we don't want to say yes or no until we've had it assessed by a specialist. We have long blade lithics from two sites from the River Pin at West Rysick Golf, just on West Rysick Golf course, and east of Har sorry, west of Harville Road from the original works. Neolithic is interesting. Apparently, it didn't happen in this part of the world. Very, very limited evidence. Some possible at the Northern Sustainable Placement area, which is um, sort of the land north of New Year's Green and the golf course. The early Bronze Age is entirely absent. And I think that actually is one of that, those two sort of absences are quite interesting. Mid Bronze Age, again, limited. Late Bronze Age, we've had some lovely cremations and potential domestic activity at the golf course. We're going to go back in the next sort of couple of months to go and investigate this further. And then we had the wonderful Hillingdon Horde. Iron Age is completely absent, <coughs> excuse me, apart from this. And then we have the limited Romano-British activity. And the wonderful 
extensive medieval activity and I can't tell you how amazing I think they made and I'm not a medievalist my my speciality is pretty history we have extensive evidence of rural industrial activity we have actually I said three kilns we don't we have four kilns we have one tile kiln one kiln that we think was either tiles or brick that's not been confirmed we have a pottery kiln and we also have a kiln from a similar sort of period 11th to 14th century which I think when I was first talking to you, we thought it was much earlier. It isn't it's from that period, it's still a bit confusing. And then the other concept is that New Year's Green perhaps is a deserted medieval settlement. We, we didn't find any evidence of domestic activity or any evidence of um, sort of anything that might be described as, as human habitation when we're looking at these kilns. But people must have been living somewhere to have been working at these sites because they didn't travel far for their work. So. We end with the early post medieval period because our lovely kiln from the golf course, the actual final episode of reuse is the 17th century. I think I may have spoken to this, you about this in the first, um, the first presentation I undertook. Now, we applied numerous techniques in Area West. We used enhanced geophysics and we used electromagnetic resonance tomography, um, which are two sort of quite high end techniques that are actually looking for um, deeply stratified deposits. What you can see there is one of our sites that we thought we might be able to detect floodplain, like re, um, sort of floodplain activity and alluvial activity. We use evaluation excavation. We use construction integrated recording, which is also which is usually called a watching and brief. And this is actually I should have incorporated this because it's a very interesting feature that we found in Houston. Um, and we're still not sure what this is. We don't know. We aren't one hundred percent certain whether it's the Stevenson Railway or a little bit later and then we also have the wide, wider excavation that we undertook at New Year's Green and some of these acti that, that particular activity and a little more trenching will be undertaken as part of STS Railways as well. So one of the techniques we looked at was geophysics um, and we've, we've still sort of we're having still having problems. Um, I have been discussing sort of um, the issues with London Clay with a very preeminent professor in the subject um, at the University of Bradford, Chris Gaffney who I've worked with previously and how we could look at this and this sort of this is almost a separate problem in itself because at the moment we have no sensible way of detecting anything that's buried below the surface we are all of our work largely is based on detailed space assessment the historic environment record and my existing knowledge and the existing knowledge of glass and historic England of this area which we all bring together to look at and try and determine where we think we're going to find sort of levels of you know um, where we're going to find archaeology so these are some of the techniques we've applied, I've suggested before, the electromagnet, the magnetometry, which is the, the grey scale here, the old sort of time team. Um, oops, I didn't want that to happen. Where are we? So the, I'm not going to do that again. So the grey, um, the grey to the um, right of your screen, yeah. And then we have the EM, the electromagnetic magnetic techniques, and the elect the electro, the electronic resi resistance tomography techniques, where we're looking for deeply buried material, which we've reinterpreted this recently, and we actually think that some of the features we encountered. We actually found in the um, the actual geophysics itself, but it wasn't particularly obvious because we were sort of looking at these techniques again and what we can how we can sort of understand them better and use them on our in the SCS work. As you can see, this is one of our kilns, which we think as you sort of roughly in that area. And then the other one was this um, also the kiln that I was talking about the, the blue with the bloomery waste, which was less than clear what its sort of um, application was. But anyway, I'm going to go through what we found now, period by period, and we'll come to the hoard. So one of the most interesting things for me is the Mousterian, because it's quite enigmatic. Um, Paleolithic evidence across the area is very limited. We've come across this relatively recently um, as part of our CIR, CIR work um, in one of the locations. It's not obvious. It's not, there is no evidence of this, this activity this early, so 45,000 years ago. Um, again, we're sort of in a period where climate's getting a little bit warmer for a very, very, very short period of time before it gets cooler again. Um, as you can see from this drawing here, the River Thames um, looks nothing like it does today. 
stills flows through Oxford, Oxford, but that big gap in the mi middle where it says High Lodge and Warren Hill was somewhere that we were hoping to look at further and gain more clarity of um, sort of, you know, if sort of what we can find sort of coming through those areas from this period. And really, this is the first evidence that's come very late in the day of anything sort of very, very, very early sort of prehistoric material. As I've suggested previously, the site that we really expected some really lovely information from Westgate Bench Shaft with the Taplow gravels, which are very early gravel. I think 40, 425,000 years old, the Taplow gravels. We didn't have any um, any of those gravels retained within the vent, uh, the, the, the strategy of what became the vent shaft. So we've got a lovely Mesolithic material. Um, so we've got um, the long blades from the golf course. As you can see, I think I present, probably presented this previously. So that's the trench and the land occupation so the horizon they came from. That's the very sort of deep red deposit that you can see in the photograph where we're standing on the end of the, the trench. And these are the, the lithics themselves. And we ha actually had a really abundant um, uh, deposit of lithics. There were 224 in total. Absolutely pristine, as some of the nicest lithics I've ever seen. And at the point that these were sort of being deposited, you're looking at a landscape that you can see in the image there. And then, as my favourite thing is that the evidence from Three Ways Wharf and from Sanders, the, the former Sanderson factory, where we have environmental evidence, suggests that we've got ranges in the air, which I think is fantastic. So, you, uh, this is one of the reasons why I love archaeology, because you build up this image, you bring data from other sites that are comparable to yours chronologically and um, you get this image of the whole start to get this image of the whole area so anyway I'm going to skip forward to the bronze age because the iron age is next um, we had our prehistoric activity again I suspect can you still see my slides excellent so um, you can see the um, I think this lovely sort of and I've got a better image of this that I'm meant to swap that out for you can see a possible round test here. Again, this is at West Ryslip. We're going to actually do more work here. This is all already proposed to be undertaken. Hopefully, we're starting very, very soon. And we have this um, cremation here. Um, when we actually sort of encountered that, um, it was just at the, just probably we're a month into um, lockdown. We we left site. I think I said this probably told you this this story the last time we left site. Well, they made everything safe for us and we came back quite quickly and we were the archaeologists were sent in first and we found some fantastic these fantastic cremations i've never seen many so many policemen turn up for what would have been a body of some antiquity that i already knew was quite old uh, in my entire career as an archaeologist but there were quite a few of them that day they must have not had a lot to do so um no and um at the moment the burial practice the actual the evidence that we've got Contrary to what I said, does suggest that there is potential for these being early, uh, earlier bronze age than we previously thought. We need these radiocarbon dated, um, and this type of act, the, the sort of, we've taken all of our material to assessment stage. So we have an idea what it is. We have an idea of its age. It's all been cleaned. It's all been washed. It's all been bagged. The next stage for this will be HS2, and they take this further in another more complex program of assessment, and these will be assessed in greater detail then by specialists. So the Iron Age. So we had absolutely no Iron Age evidence at all. And um, this was sort of coming to the end of my tenure on um, CSJV. I'd already been working for SCS Railways. Um, and this is, one, as you can see, one of our very tidy sites here. Um, one of my roles was to make sure that um, uh, I'm watching those a, a frontline supervisor. Um, and we have to have a different set of qualifications to actually undertake that role. So. I'm responsible for making sure the site is clean and tidy, our housekeeping is up to standard, and also that when our archaeologists, and this is all dri dri driving the fact that we don't want anyone to get hurt on site, and then we want to make sure everyone has a safe working environment. So every day I check that each trench we've got open is satisfactory to work in. There's no remediation required to make sure that our staff can um, enter and exit the trenches satisfactorily. Well, in the early evening of the 27th of August, it had been very, very wet um, and I went home and got damp. Um, and then the next morning we arrived and it was still very damp and I think it hadn't stopped raining very early on. So I went out to do my checks. So I walked on the trenches and during the inspection, we encountered some trenches full of water. But this water did us a massive favour because the actual material, it was, it was, it would have been it would not have been as visible as perhaps it would have been had this rain not have occurred. 
and there really was some treasure at the end of the rainbow and it looked like this so we're walking along and my colleague and I sort of um I was sort of she was I was um sort of uh, acting a mentor role and she was sort of learning to do my job and we walked along and she said goodness me what's that green puddle there and I said I have no idea so um we had a look we had a poke and it turned out to be this and we pulled out that potion now, when I first saw them, I had absolutely no clue what these were. As an archaeologist, the last thing you ever expect to find is gold and treasure. It's the first thing everyone asks you if they've ever found, and it's the last thing you say, no, I've never found any. I've found gold before in environmental samples, but never, um, never anything like this, never expected to encounter anything like this. So we pulled one out, we had a look, and I said, well, this looks sort of Saxon if you look at the actual sort of you know the, the motif itself and the way it's it's not particularly obvious what period this is from so I did what I had to do because there's more than 10 coins and it's defined as treasure I reported it um under the treasure act so I spoke to the coroner and said we found this and the coroner was as perplexed as we all were at that point because of the um the actual sort of process is not particularly clear so we discussed the finder with um and Greater London Archaeological Advisory Service and also the Portal Antiquity Scheme were absolutely invaluable and told us exactly what to do, what the process was and how long this was likely to take. So our first job was to assemble a team of appropriate people, so I managed it. Then we had Pieta Greaves, who was a conservator, and David Holman. Pieta also worked on the Staffordshire Horde. She was actually senior conservator on the Staffordshire Horde, so um, her, you know, what, what she could do is absolutely, you know, absolutely incredible and David is probably one of the nicest gentlemen I've ever worked with and his knowledge of potions is absolutely um, encyclopedic. Um, he came back to us very quickly with a report on what we got. So just to give you an idea of what we did, each item was separated out um, and given a number as you can see here. The front and the back of each potion was photographed and um, given a scale and it was all popped in a little bag and um, to await its cleaning. So I've got a, photo, a little video here and I'm going to have to cough, excuse me, <coughs> of what it looks like to clean a potion. I got to clean a couple of these and it's very, very satisfying. So there we go. I hope you can see that. And what Pieta uses to actually clean the, um, to ensure that we don't damage the potion itself is a, a Berberis um, thorn, and they're quite long thorns. So the Berberis thorn will break before you can do any damage to the potion. So you can't ever press too hard because you'll break the, 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 the thorn. And then generally it's just a simple process of cleaning them with water. And sometimes if they're particularly, um, if it doesn't want to move, it's acetone. So we had a number of fragments, and as you can see, see here, this is the effort to rejoin them. Um, it's quite, it's quite, you know, it's, it's not a particularly straightforward process, and it's sort of quite a complicated jigsaw. We were still under lockdown conditions when we were undertaking this work, um, and because um, we'd obviously got this ongoing, I, I went to Birmingham. I'm obviously from Birmingham anyway. We went to Birmingham a couple of times to have a look at sort of what was going on, and sort of to monitor the process. Um, and this is what it looked like after conservation. So as you can see, they were coming very clean. No effort was made to enhance them. So what you can see is they are the way they are. This is it today. We didn't try and return them to the state that they were in when they would have been deposited. Because actually we don't know what state they would have been and what they would have looked like when they would have been deposited. So they were left like this. Now, the way that potions were produced, um, they weren't stamped. They were produced as um, sort of a, it was, a, there was a cast, so there was a dye. And the molten um, metal, which is a combination in our case, I believe, of tin, tin, copper and bronze was poured into these sort of little flutes and they produced the potins. Now, as a result, you get some of these quite interesting sort of sprues where they haven't been trimmed particularly well. And we have some good examples of sprues here. You've got quite a large sprue, so these sort of two little additions on the end of the sprues. You've got one here that's from a central sort of um, a central a central potion and then one from an end an end item. 
so there's a few sort of interesting sort of peculiarities to each coin so on this one you can see where it's not being cut very well and just to the um right the left of your screen i think left you can see where there's part of another coin actually attached to the protein and this is just an idea of how british proteins develop now i'm not sure if you're all, if, if you if you if any of you know what how the how they came about because i knew nothing about them i i don't know a lot about them freely me i don't know much about the bronze age but they actually originally came from marseille and on the front they had the head of apollo which is quite clear on the the one from uh, marseille and a bull on the back now they migrated northwards to kent so the first sort of evidence we have of them in the uk is the kentish primary proteins and as you can see that's actually relatively clear. You can still see that there's a very sort of anthrop anthropogenic uh, anthrop um, anthropogenic face, and also the bull looks quite clear. But then, as you move towards the towards sort of later periods, it becomes more and more. It becomes less and less obvious of what you're looking at. And I think the thing that pointed to me that it could have been Anglo-Saxon was this: the the the, the um, bottom of that earlier flat linear post, where it looks as though it's the the um, white horse from Lambourne. So. We had a very, very interesting collection from the Lingdon Horde. Um, it was not a standard um, group of proteins. It had a number of proteins that were much old, sorry, much younger than any previously seen. We also had a group of proteins that had never been previously encountered before. So um, we were able from that to date it quite conclusively. So here you can see where there's been sort of um, an, F, uh, an ascent by um, David. And I should add, this is not this work is not finished. Um, this will go to further assessment. So you've got this cut this composition here where they tend to fall in the F and G category. Now the F and G category, um, as I say, are much later, which is why we're able to give it such a constrained date. Um, again, you've got composition by subgroups, the different subgroups. I, I, I'm not sure what the different subgroups, um, what the different subgroups mean. I'm, I'm aware of what the overall meaning is towards the, the horde itself. And again, a much more detailed sort of representation on the end of what these, of the composition of each subgroup. So again, we go back to fragmentary coins of the Hillingdon horde. Um, again, there was a lot of effort to try and put these together. They're actually out of the sort of borders of these. And we go back to the different sort of types that we've got. So these are the ones that are unique to our horde. So as this one suggests, it's a new reverse variety of type G2 backslash six. So again, I think this refers to how naive the actual um, image on the reverse of the coin is. And again, um, this is just a sort of a, a, an example of what sort of variation we had in the coins as a result of the, the, the manufacturing process. So again, you've got these strange striations, which are actually thought to be do with, to do with wood. They actually think that this, this um, uh, the, um, the dye for this was actually a wooden dye, not um, either sand or clay. Um, a casting floor where there's clearly been a, an air pocket or bubble. And again, errors in the verse of the design. I mean, that is for the lack of the, clar the clarity there is virtually sort of almost not like anything else that you can see amongst the group. And then a recut head on the verse where um, they, they actually think that something went wrong with the casting process and they attempted to do it again. And then we've got a map here of where pre previous sort of groups of, of previous hordes have been found. The, the one apparently that this is closely comparable to is the Tightly Horde, which was in Stansted. But they all fall within the southeast of England. They're very rare across the rest of the United Kingdom. And this is a more detailed sort of comparison by selected hordes by group. So you have the earlier hordes from Sunbury, Snettisham, um, and then you get the late with the later inclusions such as Tightly and Hillingdon. And there's and the new additions on ours make it really quite late. So this is everything basically from AD zero to um, the Roman, the, the sort of the Roman um, invasion of the UK, so of England. So we think this is sort of probably one of the latest hordes that's ever been encountered. Now, <coughs> just to finish off, I'm going to talk about the medieval because we found some lovely evidence from New Year's Green. So we were working on this when I spoke to you last again. This is something that's, that was sort of um, was actually sort of being hot off the press at the time. And I think I indicated we found a couple of, of kilns. So what was really exciting was so towards the very end of the excavation, we revealed an area. Um, we had water drainage issues and to sort of manage the water, we had to leave it in an area intact and had to be cleaned back right at the very end of the excavation works ourselves themselves. So 
we found a very substantial work area. We had structural um, evidence of something that looked like sort of a lean to a very rudimentary, um, sort of rudimentary sort of structure that was probably just three sides in a roof, which initially we interpreted as some sort of animal um, animal shelter until we found this. Um, and they were clearly exploiting nearby, the, the, the population at this time were clearly exploiting nearby assets, which I've come to at the moment. Now, the kiln of the kiln furniture was absolutely fantastic. In the image on the far side on the left, I think, um, you can see one with, flower, with sort of a flowery embossed, flowers embossed onto the actual sort of surface of the pottery. That is actually Roman. Now, having found such a lack of evidence of Roman pottery, we found that kiln furniture was clearly being reused. So that had been, by this point, this is, that had been reused for at least 700 years which is quite remarkable. We found large quantities of part for shear wear. We removed 100 buckets in the end that have all been washed and still retained. So we had a heart for shear wear kiln and you have an example of a heart for shear wear jug there. Now, what excited me particularly was this feature, which I'll be honest, I was a bit skeptical was anything at all when I saw it on the surface. And we carried on excavating and we took, took it down a bit further with the machine and had a look. And that's me actually in the trench having a look at it sort of when we first found it. And it actually transpired to be a medieval well. And we had a huge amount of waterlogged material from this well, including a lot of very, very well preserved wood. From the image in the center, you can see the, um, this, we think it's the lid of um, some sort of chest or box. We also had possible evidence of steps. We also had um, evidence of a, I won't say a winding mechanism, but I um, can't remember the proper name where, for, for raising the bucket from the well. So one of those um, triangle sort of situations where it was supposed to sort of pull the well, the, the, the bucket back off that step to give it some resistance. And also very, very handily to give us some dating evidence from when this, this deposit might, well, might, was probably deposited underneath that, um, uh, feet underneath a piece of um, chest or box or whatever this wood was, was that lovely piece of Hertfordshire wear on the end. But what was particularly exciting for me, because prior to sort of coming to work on projects like HS2 and large scale infrastructure projects, I was actually an environmental specialist. And I people who use pollen, plant remains, and also looked at sort of um, charred wood and wood remains for, for um, for identifying past um, environments. Obviously combining all this evidence together to produce sort of a really sort of comprehensive view of what the environment was like and what was being exploited and what was good to be exploited in that environment at the time. The first um, evidence I'll talk to you about um, I was, was particularly interesting actually because the majority of the pollen suggested grassland and mixed deciduous woodland, which is a pretty fair reflection of this area um, at, the, the, at this time, because we're talking the fringes of Bayhurst wood. Now, now, what was particularly interesting about the pollen um, and given the location was the fact that we had exotics. I mean, walnut trees are an importe, so that was quite interesting that they'd, um, that we had evidence of, um, pollen, of, of walnut, and obviously it's actually a species that's, um, I don't want to say stenotherm, which means it has to have warmth, but it certainly likes warmer conditions. You don't see many um, walnut trees past this sort of past London, this part of the world. There's not not many to the southwest, and there's certainly not where I come from. We also had hellebores. Curiously, we had this rock rose, and also we had opium poppy. Now, obviously, opium poppy has a uh, medicinal use, and um, uh, walnut has a, 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 a consumption use. Hell, but hellebores and rock rose were less clear. Now, we really don't know where this pollen came from. Obviously, there's um, possibilities from larger houses. We have the, man the manorial complexes at Pinchester and, Br and Brackenbury. But also, we have a possible um, uh, Templar, a uh, sorry, not Templar, Hospitaller um, church and sort of little sort of outpost not far away as well. So, were they being, um, were they being grown there? Were they being used there? We're not sure. Um, in terms of sort of uh, charred, charred evidence, well, charred and um, waterlogged plant remains, we had evidence of seeds and farm cereals and bread wheat, exactly what you'd expect to be consumed, um, spelt, emma, all the older, um, all the older sort of um, uh, cereals. We also had hazelnuts and brambles, and I can assure you that if you ever look at a, a sort of a 
an assemblage of um, water log plant, you will always get um, bramble. And we also have evidence of watercress, which is quite interesting. Again, we're not too far, we're not too far from the New Year's born, and it's certainly quite wet around in those parts. And then my phone, which is paleoentomological evidence, the beetles, um, we had evidence of fell rotting material. So this is telling us that at the head of the well, we've got sort of large sort of accumulations of probably rotting straw. Um, the beetle at the top is a dung beetle, a phodius. Now, they aren't necessarily restricted to dung. They'll also live in sort of this accumulation of this type of material. So it's not clear that animals were there. We also didn't find a lot of animal bone there, whether that's a symptom of the fact that the clay that we're on is not favourable for, for preserving this type of material or um, whether this is um, a general bias that the, we, but I think it's more like it's actually a preservation thing not the fact there was never any animal, animal bone there and again this little um, staphylin which is an oxytellus again they like um, foul rotting material too we have evidence of grassland in the two um, the two the the, the um, Curculonidae, um, the true weevil and the Eleteridae, which is a clip beetle, and also of living woodland, we had Anobium punctatum, which is a common woodworm, and also um, one of the family of the um, Scolitis, so the uh, elm bark beetles, but not any of the key indicators of that, that disease in this, um, this area. And a far more unwelcome visitor, which was this, which is Pulex irritans, which is the human flea. And there was quite there was a quite a few of those examples that manifested from the well. So what did all this lovely environmental evidence tell us? So it told us that they with well, it seems to be quite clear, and this is one of the, the research themes that we've still got in SCS, is that the that Banghurst wood we think was asserted. Um with I, I, I'm starting to think that there was quite a substantial cover of um dense woodland across quite a lot of the area north of New Year's Green quite into quite sort of relatively late so the 12th, 12th 14th century or there was some sort of evidence of re advance because I can't think of any other reason for the paucity of archaeology in some of the areas that we're encountering um we have evidence of this settlement this rural activity um so what, where was the the domestic activity it's clearly dispersed or are we just not in the area that the domestic settlement was in are we are we missing something or are we just not to you know we're not very far away from it so there is still a number of questions but the woodland was clearly being exploited for its charcoal for the um the purposes of sort of all these kilns that are across across this 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 area and also we have the use of the um london clay and the clay itself for pottery for brick for um manufacturing um uh, pots and jugs and so and then finally, just a quick one about restoratic golf course when we're going back there. I think I probably spoke to you this about before. I've got this fantastic ridge and furrow, um, as you can see from the LIDAR. And obviously it was created by the, the way that the plowing methodology at the time, where the, 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 the oxen couldn't quite sort of make the circle to turn round. Obviously, that's six oxen is something to manage. And you get this fanta the fantastic ridge and furrow. And again, we have the medieval tar kiln. And, and again, this is just a fantastic example of how natural resource in this area being used. You would have needed wood to fire it, which we seem to have a lot of, um, lots of clay and plenty of water. So again, this was subject to repeated reuse and finally abandoned in the 17th century. And one of the things that we found was this lovely silver long cross pet, which was actually found in one of the walls. Um, and also my favourite, still my favourite find, hoard or not, of the dog's paw prints, excuse me, in the tile. And again, as I say, we're going back in this area to look for further evidence. But thank you for listening to me this evening. Thank you very much indeed, Emma. That's a lovely uh, update on what you uh, gave us um, in November 2020 and absolutely fascinating to see that hoard of coins. And I'm sure members will have uh, plenty of questions about those and the other finds, the medieval finds, uh, uh, amazing to, uh, to see what habitation was like in those days. And I think we knew that there was lots of brick and tile making in the area. Um, are those the sort of kilns you think they are or were they more domestic yes. kilns? Yeah. yeah, we think we the, they, we certainly think that the kiln at um, West Ryslip and the kiln at Harville Road um, were tile or brick kilns, and we're certain that the one at New Year's Green was Hertfordshire. Where?
Yes. Yeah, but I'm, ho- I'm hoping to find more kilns, actually. <laughs> lovely, lovely. <laughs> well, over to it, members now. I'm sure you'll have loads of questions to ask as a result of that fascinating talk. So if you want to ask Emma a question, um, Joan, you've put your hand up. Please just unmute yourself and talk. Um, uh, very much enjoyed the lecture. Thank you very much. Um, at the very beginning, um, before before you got into the thing, I may have misunderstood, but you were saying that you were um, excavating for two different purposes, the stuff to the west of Harville Road? No, no, it's um, our work is all combined. So what I do east of Harville Road in my area, which is um, area south and C1, um, which is area central, we combine our results and look at them together. So it's all done as a landscape based piece of work. But what are the, um, I mean, are, are all of it part of um, HS2? Yes. Right. Thank you. M- Melanie, you've got your hand up. Uh, yes. Um, j- just a, a comment. Um, we don't know precisely where, where these were. We know there was tile making in the Clack Lane area. Yes. But, um, I just thought I'd mention that in 1290, there was an Alfred Tyler who had an acre called Gore Acre mm. somewhere, presumably That's in that direction. Mm. And in much later in 1435, John Madder had the right to break up, dig and project the ground and to carry, carry and take away thereupon the mud and sand and to enjoy, make, give, occupy and sell tiles thereupon to the proper use and profit of the same John and one tile, one kiln there to burn and dry the aforesaid tiles. This this was on the edge of the woods, I think. That would be lovely if we could um, relate that to something that we found. It would be useful to know which woods it was. Do you know which woods it was, Melanie? Uh, well, it's, it was the common wood um, that at that stage belonged to the king. Okay, because I think I, I, I think it was Jane that mentioned, because one of the things that we've got on the cards for um, hopefully the golf course, we're hoping to do a walk around the golf course to look at some of the, the historical oh, landscape yes. and what we've found. Yes. And I think you've been looking at the golf course, haven't you? Um, not me personally. But uh, what we have been doing is going through medieval documents that are held at King's mm-hmm. College. That would be really, because it would be really interesting to understand some of that, because we've produced, a de- and I don't know whether it's in public domain yet, but we produced a detailed desk based, well, a, de- a desk, I won't call it detailed, a desk based assessment. And it would be really lovely to look at your results and what we got there. It would be yeah. because... Yeah, it, it, uh, that, that's really interesting because one of the, obviously you've got Tall Kill Lane as well, and it absolutely and Clack Clack there Clack suggests to me to a mill. Yes. Or is it something yes. else? You know, it's, it's that I'm um I've been here long enough now. I've been in this area long enough now to you know to sort of start to pick up on sort of, sort of some of these trends and sort of looking through um to understand the landscape and to understand what I'm looking at in terms of the whole. Yeah. So to actually get that all together would be fantastic. It, I mean, we, we do know like that, to, that um, there was tile tile making in the area um, mm. towards where, where, where you're you're mm. looking at. Mm. Um, it's it's difficult sometimes to pinpoint. Yes. Where where these things are happening, mm. um, but as mm. you say, the the clay is is suitable. Mm. Um, so. Um, Yes, I, I mean, our, our medieval documents group um, will very happily see what we can come up with for you. I'd be very interested to talk. Yeah, I would think that would be really useful as well, actually. I do. So, yeah. And we're champing at the bit to do the tour around the golf course. Yeah, too. no, I, I feel awful, actually, because I was hoping to come here today and give you a day, uh, give you a date and time to do that. But we haven't yet. But please, honestly, I've not forgotten about this because it's something very close to my heart, actually, because I love West Rice Golf Course and the landscape we've got there. And I think mm. to actually sort of share our knowledge, I think to actually go on some sort of tour like this, walk like this, where we could share mutually share our knowledge as well would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It would, what yeah. we haven't been studying, unfortunately, is St Catharines, which is a big tile making area. 
um, that that was part of the manor of Harmonsworth. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of documents from that manor, but we don't mm. know how many give precise information about no. Rislip. And we haven't no. had the resources to, to look at those. Mm. Mm. No, it's very, it's very, very, that, that's very interesting. That, is that we've got something documented that's so um, close to the mark, shall we say. Mm. Uh, 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 you won't have found that in your desk study because it's no. unpublished and it's, it's brand <laughs> no. new, just as you're mm. telling us brand new archaeology we're well, it, telling it, you yeah. it isn't brand totally new... unpublished because it is available on our website yes um the, all, all the documents that we've studied have, mm. have been um tra translated from from the latin right and are available on the society's website so okay. if you do a word search, um, you, you might be able to find a bit more. Mm. I think I think it would be great to talk to you about it as well if we can arrange this tour too. I really do. Yeah. But we haven't forgotten about that at all. That that is that, that is very much at the forefront. In fact, I'm speaking to somebody about it on Wednesday. So I will honestly keep you posted. You are at the um all this is this organization at the top of the list to see it first yep so thank you so, so we're quite proud of this emma this research we funded uh, i bet King's you are yes, so you be, yes we'd obviously appreciate any acknowledgements uh, that you can give oh, in yes. your uh, <laughs> yeah, findings no, and well, any uh, yeah. yes uh, and uh, it's obviously cost the society money but we've of course uh, uh, we're, right. we're we're very pleased to have done that and to share it with other, other people interested in it I'll take this away with me this evening and discuss it. Thank you. Right. right. Can I say something? I don't Please know do. To speak. Um, yes, yours. Yes, well, yes. before we get too carried away, the wood referred to would, of course, be Northwood, because the wood, the area that you've been dealing with, was not mm -hmm. part of the old ancient manor of Ricelip. No. Actually. Is that right? So, yes. I would... Go as far as um, that. Well, you. I think you 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 may cross the boundary at some point. Might be, but the wood was was northward. So. But but there was a lot of woodland in both Ryslip and Northwood that was more or less contiguous in the period we're talking about. So anyway, perhaps that's something we need to discuss amongst ourselves and uh, uh, form a view on. But. Um, Mm. I, I, there, there, there was an awful lot of woodland, as I understand it, throughout Ryslip and extending through into Northwood, all of which was in the parish of uh, Ryslip. But um, obviously there are boundaries as you, as you move towards yes. the Harefield direction. And, and the Ekenham direction. Yes. And, and, Bay, the, and yeah. Bayhurst Wood, that yeah. end is was yes. St Catherine's Manor. Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes, it's unfortunate that we we haven't, I mean, we've picked up a few things that have been published on St. Catherine's Manor, but um, we, we, we haven't studied those documents in depth because they're much more complicated. I've not come across St. Catherine's Manor. Which one is St. Catherine's Manor? Where, where was the sort of boundaries of that? I've not come across that at all. So that's interesting to me as well. Um, well, it's, do you know Ladygate Lane? I do know Lady Gate Lane, yes. Yeah, I that's know. in St Catherine's Manor. Right, okay. It, it was interesting. Up in, in, in that corner. Sure. It, it was a very small area that was an outlier of the Manor of Harmonsworth, as I understand yes. it. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, no problem. Mm. No, it's not. I mean, there, there, was, there was clearly land holding that bridged the two. Yes, yes, I'm sure, yeah. No, so it's it's really fascinating. You, yes, you, I mean yeah. our, our tilers may not be relevant to the to the actual find findings uh, on the HS two line. It's it's difficult to tell. We're looking at the landscape perspective, so all these tilers are. Um... <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean that there there is evidence that obviously in 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 Eileen's book, which I'm sure you you have the goodliest. The goodliest place in Middlesex? No, we do not. I've never oh. seen that before. Oh, there you go, see? That That's is it. the Ricelip Bible. <laughs> you can't do any work in this area without it. <laughs> well, now I know. I do know. Any, that's anything it. by I'm, Eileen yeah. Bolt. B-O-W-L-T. Okay. No <laughs> uh, because no. she's also done a bit on Ickenham as well. Very um, fantastic. It's, it's val very valuable. Excellent. Yes. Thank you very much for pointing me in that direction. Yes. 
She, she's our society president, and I think she's listening in on this call, so uh, her, her ears are probably burning. <laughs> I was going to say, I know I'm embarrassed now. Not to uh, but we'll, we'll redress that balance. Thank yeah. you. Any more points or questions from anybody? Could I just ask, no, Simon? No. Please do. Um, what eventually will happen to all these fines? I mean, will any perhaps be come back locally, or will they all be to the Museum of oh, London, or what? I would hope so. I certainly hope the hoard is going to come somewhere. I don't think it will come here, but I think the hoard may stay. Optimistically, I'm hoping it will stay in the local area. But at the moment, all our material is being curated. And I actually go and visit it to make sure that it's been maintained correctly. Um, so we've got boxes in a storage area, in, in a storage sort of that's been um, stored by one of the archaeology units that work for us, the CSJV. And they've also come over to SCS. So I go and visit every six months to make sure everything's sort of um, ship shape and brisk, quite literally Bristol fashion. And then ultimately, HS2 will take this forward to a programme of um, what we call in the business is updated project design, which is basically further analysis for the material that's, you know, sort of um, worthy of it. And actually, we're from having very little at the end of 2019. What we're getting now from Rice, we have quite a, a significant corpus of um, archaeological evidence that will probably go forward to update, will go forward to analysis. So it should, it'll be quite exciting. And that's going to be undertaken by a separate organisation. At the moment, I make recommendations for what, I, for what work, further work I think should be undertaken and which sites should go forward. And then it'll go from there. So it could be obviously some years before all this. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can I can give you an example actually of a large the large scale infrastructure project. And I won't tell you which one. I worked on before I came on to HS two. I am a regular visitor to the town that I stayed in um, while I was um, undertaking the works, and I visited their local museum um, last year, and they still haven't had any of the material percolate through from the actual archaeological excavation that was undertaken all the way around their area. So it's not, not a fast process, but I think that the general will of HS2 is to return this material as much, you know, if, if the, the, I think, um, I can, I can actually find out whether, to be honest, what, what the actual sort of intention is, but I'm sure some of it is to deposit in local museums. Thank you. Joan, you've got your hand up again. Uh, yes. Um... How much of how many or these sites will be destroyed when the um, work carries on? That's an interesting question because archaeology itself is an inherently destructive process. Now, the best way to do archaeology is not to do archaeology. So we <laughs> like to leave it if we can where it is. Um, because we might develop technologies and techniques in the future whereby we can look at it under the ground and we don't have to disturb it and construction methodologies that mean that we don't. And we look at construction methodologies now. Um, I work on another large scale infrastructure project, which I won't tell you where it is, but I'm looking at methods of ways at the moment where I can design the archaeology or the areas of archaeological of interest away from the engineering works. So to change the actual, to change the engineering to incorporate the archaeology. And that has actually been undertaken under HS2. We the, there are places where the archaeology has been such significance that's been found as part of the assessment where the um, works no longer impact that area. So unfortunately, where I've gone and excavated archaeology, I've already destroyed the archaeology, but we've fully recorded it. It's been characterised and we have in post in perpetuity at the moment to make sure that we get as much information from what we recovered from those areas as we possibly can. Thank you. Any more points or questions? The last chance. Right, well, before I thank Emma again um, for such a fascinating talk and also the fascinating responses to the questions and discussions, uh, just a reminder that we meet next on Tuesday, the 20th of September. So at 8 p.m. in St. Martin's Church Hall, for those of you who wish to turn up in person, which I hope is the majority of you, uh, we'll also be streaming it on Zoom, we hope, so that you can watch it at home if you prefer. And on the 20th of September, Dr. Rudy Newman, who's an historian and writer, will be talking about from scythes 
to suburbia the socio-economic impacts of the coming of the railways to the Chilterns. So that will be our next meeting because we traditionally take a break in the summer, as you know. And But I very much look forward to welcoming you back in person to St Martin's Church Hall and to uh, resuming the sort of meetings we, we, we had uh, until two years ago. So it only remains for me to thank uh, Emma again for very much indeed for such a fascinating talk and I've learned so much I've learned quite a few abbreviations I now know what a DMV is <laughs> and uh, I, I was a little hazy on what a long blade lithic was but I've now got the idea that a lithic is presumably from Lycos the Greek for stone so it, anything made of stone is presumably a lithic so uh, I've learned an awful lot as well as of course the detail of what you've actually found in our area so Thank you very much again uh, for joining us once more and we very much look forward to meeting you when you're able to guide us uh, on a walk around so. site and uh, we'll keep in touch as we've discussed particularly with our medieval research group to share what we can with you that have been found in the records at King's College Cambridge so uh, without more ado that's the end of the meeting for this season thank you very much for joining us everybody over the whole of this season have a really great summer and I very much look forward to seeing you all on Tuesday, the 20th of September in St. Martin's Church Hall at 8 p.m. So bye bye for now and have a great summer. Should we explain why it's Tuesday and that we will be meeting on Tuesdays fr from now on? Uh, good idea, Melanie. Um, it's Tuesday because we can meet at eight o'clock prompt. Um, and so turn up about 10 minutes before the meeting will actually start at eight because we're not following a ballet class if we meet on a Tuesday. So that's why we changed day of the week so that we've got the hall from uh, a, a bit before quarter to eight, I think, set up so that the meeting will start promptly at eight. So it will be on Tuesdays for, for the foreseeable future now. So thank you for that prompt, Melanie.